and health, a WHO simulation, sexual and reproductive health, race and health, and access to medicines. Um, this term, we're putting on a lecture series that will run weekly until the 16th of March. Um, so please feel free to check out our other events that are listed on our social channels and term card. Our next event um, is at the same time next week, and that will be on the topic of can the pandemic um, and recession reduce our complacency about poverty and health, which will be with Dr. Danny Dorling um, from the University of Oxford. Um, so just to note, uh, this event is being recorded. Um, we'll have a Q&A session for the last 10 or 15 minutes of the talk. Um, if you would like to ask a question, feel free to just post it in the chat or message me directly with it. And I can kind of collate them at the end and, and ask, ask them to Julia. Um, and then just in the interest of helping our kind of connection and bandwidth, if you could please keep yourself on mute um, for the duration of the talk, that would be perfect. Um, great, so I will pass over to um, Dr. Robinson. Um, thank you very much for joining us and I will let you introduce yourself and kick it off. Okay, and now I will go ahead and share my screen. Hi everyone. Um, uh, it, it, can everyone hear me okay? Uh, yeah, okay, great. Um, hi, I am so delighted to be here with you today. Um, I'm Julia Robinson. I am uh, an activist with the People's Health Movement, and I'm also affiliated with the University of Washington. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about the work that I've been doing over the past, well, I guess it's been my entire professional life, um, involving global health advocacy. Um, I titled the talk Policy to Action because I'm a very passionate um, advocate for making sure that policy informs programming and programming informs policy. So a lot of you might be interested in getting into the field of global health. And um, I feel that this subject particularly is one in which um, I think it has the most direct impact for people um, in that we are using actual community experience to inform policy making. And we'll talk a little bit about the divide between the two sometimes as well. Um, so I love to start with this slide because this is um, a mural from Mozambique. Um, it has to do with um, HIV awareness, kind of in the earlier days of the HIV epidemic. You got to see a lot of this community art spring up. And I think as public health workers, we often forget about the importance and value of art in terms of community messaging. And I just thought that this was such a beautiful mural and such a beautiful image. And I like to always start my talks with it to put in a plug for making sure that when we're thinking about global health and advocacy um, and programming that we never forget the importance of, I guess, speaking in um, a powerful art. So with that said, I'll move on to kind of, um, oh shoot, oh, there we go. Sorry about that. I'll start with a little bit of an introduction of myself. So. Um, as I mentioned, I am an advocate with the People's Health Movement and the um, University of Washington. I spent about the first 15 years of my um, postgraduate career working on implementing HIV programs in West Africa. I was a program manager with an organization affiliated with the University of Washington. Um, I've since recently kind of switched positions and careers a little bit, but I'm still very involved in global health and still very much involved in global health advocacy. Um, I got into the field because when I finished university, I became a volunteer with the United States Peace Corps. I went to Benin, West Africa as a rural community health volunteer. And it really sparked, I think that this was really the genesis of my, um, my passion for advocacy. Um, you know, I was stationed in a very small village um, in the north of Benin. And it was the first time I had experienced kind of the NGOification of global health of public health programming. Um, you know, we would be doing some really like hot, dusty work at the village level and see some of these um, NGOs roll up in their shiny land cruisers with their air conditioning. And it was this divide that I felt in terms of the people who, I guess, controlled the financing and implementation of health programs versus the lived experience of people on the ground. And I, kind of decided at that point that that was what I really wanted to focus on, was making sure that that divide, um, that we could bridge that divide, that we could make sure that these community voices were really centered and um, could influence the way that programming and financing were implemented. So it's always been something that's been in the back of my 
it's not the back of my head, it's been in the front of all of my thoughts. It really drives most of my work and my publishing and my, um, my ad advocacy and action moving forward. So um, I'm just going to start with kind of overall what is advocacy. I know that a lot of us have been working um, in policy making and policy change. A lot of people, especially now, I feel like it's a very political age. It's a very it's an age that's very focused on um, centering and lifting voices that have been marginalized. So I, I like this particular definition. I know that it's from Wikipedia, which is kind of I don't know, maybe I'm not supposed to put a Wikipedia quote on an, ad, on an advocacy presentation, but I like it because it focuses on many different levels of advocacy. Advocacy can be performed at the individual or group level. It's really focused on influencing public policy, and that's something that's owned by us all. Um, and then there's lots of different systems that we can impact as well. And health is interesting because it really touches all of these different systems. It's political, it's economic, it's social, it's a lot of other things as well. But thinking about global health advocacy, it's really this, it's one of the hugest umbrellas, I feel like, because it influences so many other aspects of life. So, you know, there's lots of different things that people advocate for, whether it's policy or human rights. Um, you know, there's different motivations and passions that drive us all. Um, overall, though, I think that 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 one the, that we try overall to influence decision makers, whether we are decision makers and we're trying to influence others, whether we are not decision makers and we are trying to both share our stories and in influence what kinds of policy is made at the end of the day. Um, Richard Horton, who is the editor of The Lancet, um, you know, really, I had this on a post-it on my wall for a long time until <laughs> we all stopped working from offices. But I love this quote because it really underlies what we should be doing as public health workers, and especially in the field of global health. Public health is a science of social justice, overcoming the forces that undermine the future security of families, communities, and peoples. And I think that that is something that, as a future public health professional, that that's something that you never forget, is that ultimately we are working in the realm of social justice, and that is what should drive all of our work and our decisions and our financing and our programming and our advocacy. So in working in advocacy, a lot of times I think it's an uphill struggle, right? There's a lot of work that you can do trying to make political change or social change, and you won't ever see the results of it. It's very easy to become burned out in, if you're working in advocacy. Um, so I like to start this talk with some wins that public health advocacy has had before. Um, one, of the, one of the foundational wins, I feel like, is um, in the 1970s, Nestle, which is a food company, started marketing um, formula powder as being kind of the most, um, the most nutritious thing you could provide for your baby. And they started a public health, or not a public health, they started a PR, a global PR campaign in which they promoted breast, or formula powder as something that is superior to breast milk. Now, in a lot of places, um, you know, one of the things you have to do to make formula powder into something you could feed an infant is to mix it with water. Um, a lot of places in the global south do not have adequate water supplies for, especially for rural families and rural communities. And so in marketing this formula powder as being something that's superior to breast milk, they were telling families and communities that they should be, you know, using this in it instead of formula powder. So they were or, I'm sorry, instead of breast milk. So basically um, what happened is that we had an outbreak and an epidemic of a lot of babies in different parts of the world being fed formula instead of breast milk, and they would get all kinds of diarrheal diseases because they were mixing the formula powder with unsafe water. Now, uh, advocates from around the world um, were pressuring Nestle to stop some of these aggressive marketing campaigns to promote formula powder. And Ultimately, they organized a global boycott of Nestle in order to try to influence how they were unrolling some of their marketing campaigns. And it worked. People stopped buying Nestle products, and Nestle finally changed some of their marketing policies so that it was um, so that they weren't promoting it as a as a superior option to breastfeeding. Another uh, another global health advocacy campaign, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in depth um, in the talk, is. Um, you know, when HIV was really taking over, especially Sub-Saharan Africa, but other places as well, 
you know, there were eventually there started to be drugs that were available that were really unaffordable for most of the world. Um, you know, there was a picture in that there's a picture in the lower right left hand um, part of this slide where you can see some of the boy or some of the protests on the White House in Washington, D.C., um, trying to pressure some of the pharmaceutical companies to lower the prices to open up AIDS drugs for generics. Um, and it ended up working. It was the work, it was the hard work over many, many years of all of these advocates to try to pressure both policymakers at the governmental level and at the pharmaceutical level to lower these drugs to make them more accessible for, um, for people living with HIV. Finally, this is one that um, I think as coming from an academic setting, I think is an interesting example of a kind of a, an advocacy win, I would say, is um, when Osama bin Laden was, I guess, found and ultimately murdered in Afghanistan, um, you know, the way that they were able to find him is that they, that the, um, people were posing as vaccination workers and they were going from door to door trying to locate where Bin Laden was, um, was hiding. Now, this is problematic on a lot of levels. <laughs> you know, whenever you see va vaccination campaigns um, being used as, as a cover for spies, that, that really um, undermines the public trust in vaccine campaigns and vaccination campaigns around the world. So a lot of the deans of schools of public health from across the United States um, pressured <laughs> the U.S. government to commit to not using vaccine workers or vaccine campaigns as a ruse, I guess, to, um, to, uh, to, to, to do all of the different espionage campaigns around the world. And, and that also was effective. Um, it's really important for us to be able to divide between public health and either, um, I guess, global health security if, and whenever we can to be able to make sure that the public can trust public health workers. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit um, and talk about some different kinds of campaigns, current campaigns that are um, being done to influence public health um, policy and different kinds of advocacy campaigns. So one organization I'm very involved with is called the People's Health Movement. So the People's Health Movement is a global grassroots organization with the underlying aim of health for all now. It's a, there are chapters all over the world. <laughs> so there's a chapter that's active I know in the UK, um, PHM Europe is also something that's very, very active. Um, but there's country chapters all over the place. And um, it's been around for about 30 years now. And um, we'll go into some of the different programs that they have ongoing. And then we're going to talk a little bit about some current campaigns that are going on now. So, so this will be kind of a case study in an active global health advocacy campaign, um, specifically around the current COVID crisis. So the People's Health Movement um, was founded in 2000. I guess it's not 30 years old, it's 20 years old, sorry about that. Um, founded in 2000 after the first People's Health Assembly. So this is dedicated to the principles set, of, set forth at Alma Ata. So this is kind of, Alma Ata was a uh, conference that was held in 1978. It defined and, um, and kind of made the world commit to some, uh, um, I'm sorry, primary health care principles and practices to ensure health equity for the world's population. So even the people who are um, maybe the most vulnerable or the most distant from health services. The founding document for the People's Health Movement is the Pe People's Charter for Health. You can find it online. You can sign on as an individual. You can sign on as an organization. Um, and it can, and it's, it's basically a manifesto of sorts to have folks sign on to um, the, the principle of health for all now. So this is PHM's vision. I won't read it word for word, but um, it is focused on equity and it is uh, a bold vision for a world, a better world um, that has health access and health equity at its center. It's a, I guess it's important to underline as well that P PHM is an a network that is driven by leaders from the global south. So I'm currently located in Seattle, Washington, but I, um, but North America and Europe are not the drivers of the people's health movement, but we do support its aims and we do um, work in solidarity with activists all over the world. And it's really a community-led vision. So 
um, our programs and our campaigns are very local. Our, you know, our PHM USA kind of priorities are very different from PHM Kenya's priorities, for instance. Um, but that's, that's how we feel is the most appropriate way to go about global health advocacy. Here are some of the ongoing programs of People's Health Movement that you can jump in on at any time if you'd like. Um, the People's Health Assembly is something that is kind of a convening, I guess. There haven't been that many of these because they're pretty big events and it's a pretty big effort to try to get people to convene um, from all across the globe. The last one was held in Bangladesh in November 2018. Um, Global Health Watch is a publication that comes out periodically. It is an alternative to the World Health Organization's World Health Report. So the WHO will, um, I think it's on a yearly basis, they will um, release kind of the state of the world's health and that's called the World Health Report. Global Health Watch is committed to kind of doing a state of the world's health, but from a community perspective. So you have case studies from all over the world talking about some of the most pressing global health equity issues that, are, um, that communities are facing. Um, there are now five editions of this, and the sixth one is being drafted as we speak. Um, all five of them are available online, um, and you can go check them out. And they're very, very interesting and very powerful. So I recommend that you do that if you have, them, if you have the time. So we're going to take kind of this background of like, what is global health advocacy? What is the people's health movement? And we're going to see kind of how PHM is dealing with advocacy in COVID. Um, you know, COVID is something that has, I, this is not an original thought, but COVID has definitely shined a light on um, some of the in health inequities and social and economic inequities that existed before COVID. So COVID seemed to magnify them. This happens throughout um, history, really, every time there is a global crisis. We saw this with the Ebola outbreak as well. There were all kinds of health inequities that existed in terms of, you know, West Africa, for instance, doesn't have very many doctors that are available. And nobody seemed to really notice until Ebola came around. <laughs> well, not nobody. West Africans definitely noticed how many doctors were um, available. But the world at writ large and funding organizations writ large ignored a health healthcare worker crisis until, you know, it became something that could affect rich countries. So the same thing is happening now with COVID. Um, and we're going to talk about two major topics. We'll talk a little bit about vaccine production and trade. So how do trade policies affect vaccine production um, and distribution? And then we'll talk a little bit about this campaign that's going on just today. <laughs> just now, I was able to update the slides today with something that was just um, a petition that was just released today that you all can get involved with if you're interested. So starting out, we'll talk a little bit about intellectual property drugs and devices. So this is something that, again, predated COVID. Um, I'm not sure what everyone's background is with, in, with trade policy, but I'll try to kind of cover some basic concepts as, as succinctly as I can. Um, but there's a whole world of trade policy and trade um, advocacy that you can get involved with. Another organization that I'm very involved with on the local level is called the Washington Fair Trade Coalition, which works for just trade policies in all aspects of life. I kind of focus on the health-related aspects myself, but trade touches everything. It touches economics, it touches um, the environment, it touches migration, um, all kinds of things. But there are, um, we'll go a little bit into kind of how intellectual property provisions within trade agreements affect access to medicine. So I think even though we've only been together for about 20 minutes or so, I'm sure you're not going to be surprised that I feel that the deck is stacked when it comes to trade policy. Um, trade agreements are often written to make the rich richer at the expense of the poor. And intellectual property regulations are major tools that make this happen. So to put it briefly, intellectual property regulations are ways in which um, pharmaceutical companies and multilateral corporations can ensure that um, creating more, create, the, the drug prices stay high. Um, and they do that through a lot of different ways. Um, primarily, they use patent laws that, are, that exist in many different countries already. Um, these trade agreements supersede a lot of times national laws. Um, once countries sign on to trade agreements, those, if, if there is a trade agreement that has a provision within it that is more stringent than a national law, 
often the trade agreement will take precedent. So the way that th these things get written into trade agreements, a lot of times pharmaceutical companies will negotiate lengthy monopoly periods. So if a pharma company is able to create a new kind of drug or a new formulation of an existing drug, they will make sure that their um, the generic production is restricted or forbidden um, for a lengthy monopoly period. Pharma companies are often allowed to charge whatever they want. Um, and you know, again, that will supersede national laws and regulations a lot of times. Evergreening is a process that is very tricky. Um, it's something that pharma companies really exploit quite a bit. Um, basically what they can do is take an existing monopoly or an existing patent that they have and either change the formula slightly, they might change the dosage is a very um, common thing that pharma companies will do is they'll change the dosage just slightly um, so that they can renew their patent and reset the clock on their monopoly period. So this can be done most often, this is done with drugs, but it can also be done with devices. Um, as technology advances, as um, we get a little bit more efficient with, especially a lot of the devices that are, um, that are either robotic or connected to the internet, you can change the structure or kind of the, the way that a device is packaged slightly, and that will also reset the clock on the monopoly period. So all of this is just to keep the control of these life-saving drugs and devices in the hands of the pharmaceutical companies and restrict access to either generics or um, any kind of competition that might lower the price and make things more accessible for the population. So again, we talked a little bit about this before, the classic example of um, IP regulations um, restricting access to medicine is with HIV drugs. So when HIV was really taking over, um, the earliest medications cost $10,000 a year or more. To, and it's not because they were made out of like gold powder or something. It was just because the pharma companies claimed research and development or whatever their reasoning was to um, say that, you know, these, these drugs really need to be this expensive. And no one can afford $10,000 a year or more for drugs and especially people in low and middle income countries where HIV was really taking a toll. Um, it, this is just inaccessible. I remember when I was in the Peace Corps, um, we were basically told to keep our HIV, um, our HIV work to talking only about HIV prevention because HIV drugs were just not available in West Africa at the time, even though they were available in rich countries, um, they just, they were too expensive and too, inaccessible for people in low and middle income countries to access. So we had to only talk about AIDS prevention because otherwise, you know, it's like, what do you do? You tell people that drugs are available, but you, they're not available for you, which um, can really, it's not a very productive public health campaign. So, um, you know, with HIV drugs, again, related to that advocacy that we had seen before, once those patents were removed or um, the patent laws were, were less restrictive, it opened the way for generic drug development. And that just slashed the prices of HIV drugs. So, you know, the same drug that was charged $10,000 $10, a year, you know, is now $150 a year or less. Um, that price is lowering all the time. And that was due to, you know, the work of tireless work of advocates in over many, many years. So, you know, a lot of us have been talking about COVID and at, with the build up to the vaccine and now that the vaccine is becoming, is available and it's rolling out to more and more places, you know, we're in this kind of emergency phase right now where COVID-19 vaccines are, are, being on, are being rolled out in at least in rich countries pretty quickly, as quickly as the supply can keep up with them. But, you know, thinking about how we will move eventually we will move from this emergency pandemic phase to more of a maintenance phase. COVID's not going to go away overnight. We're not sure if we're going to be needing, you know, kind of like the flu, like booster shots or whatever. So one thing that we do know is that COVID vaccines are built off of existing drugs. So if the past is precedent, <laughs> you know, we can, we can anticipate that pharmaceutical companies are going to try to use patent protections like evergreening, um, like some of these lengthy monopoly periods to try to keep the price of these drugs high. 
Um, we'll talk in just a few minutes about kind of the inequitable distribution of these drugs, but even in places where it is available, we can predict that pharma companies could very well go down the, the road of making these drugs prohibitively expensive um, or only accessible to people with good insurance, for instance. Um, you know, we had talked a little bit before about how some of these intellectual property things also intersect with um, devices. So in the early days of COVID last March and April or May, you know, there was, a, there was a lot of discussion about ventilators. There weren't enough ventilators in hospitals. Um, and the shortage of these ventilators actually led to people, a lot of people working in hospitals actually, to come up with these like 3D printed hacks. So the same part that would cost $10,000 on the market, people were able to figure out how to 3D print for a dollar. And you know this kind of it, it just shines a light on kind of how arbitrary some of this pricing is, right? Like if you could print it for a dollar, why were any companies charging ten thousand dollars for that same part? Um, so we kind of think about again past this precedent, and one of these questions that we don't really understand yet is how are these IP regulations going to be used um, in the future to impact the dissemination of some of these affordable parts? Um, and that's just something we don't know yet, but advocates can kind of anticipate this, this type of scenario and try to plan um, a campaign to try to ensure equity in the future. So again, I, I mentioned that I've worked with some different organizations that are involved with some of these things. Um, you know, one thing, kind of a basic tenet of advocacy as well, is that we tend to, as advocates, react to things. So we see injustice and we want to talk about it. We want to say, this isn't right. We need to change it. Um, but another tool, I think more effective potentially, um, well, that is an effective tool. I think that shining light on inequity and injustice is very important. But I also think it's up to us to try to build the world that we want. Um, you know, the system that we have now didn't fall down from the sky, right? Like people invented it, people maintain it, people perpetuate systems of inequity. And if that is true, then we can also create and maintain and perpetuate an equitable society. It's kind of my, my maybe naive hope. <laughs> it's what keeps me going and keeps me from being burnt out in advocacy. Um, so I think I try to be involved with a lot of organizations that actually do try to define their ideal world. What do we want? So um, this group, Public Citizen, is one that's been very active um, in terms of COVID-19, um, principles for global access. Um, one of the, the early documents, I guess, around COVID-19, and I think it still drives a lot of their campaign, is uh, around these four principles. So innovation for all, insisting that data and patents be public goods. Um, a lot of this research was funded by governments, and as such, it should be accessible to the public. Um, access for all. So ensuring that access to diagnosis, treatment, vaccines take priority over profit, especially in a pandemic. I mean, really these principles should be unrolled to all health if you ask me, but especially in a pandemic um, where, it's, uh, where people are dying at a disproportionate rate. Um, global solidarity, this one is important because countries aren't always great at working together. Um, they tend to kind of lock down. We've seen this with COVID as well, with the shutting of borders, with the shutting of um, research and that kind of thing. But the importance of putting global solidarity um, at the forefront, um, I think COVID is probably an example of an epidemic that really has spread all over the world, much more than any other epidemic we've seen in recent years. Um, and again, good governance is another really important principle. So ensuring equity and transparency and participation amongst all, um, all countries across the world. So um, I'll just wrap up a little bit of this talk here with um, talking about vaccine distribution and equity. And this is, the, this is the part that I was saying that really, I just pulled this today. This was just published today. Um, there's been a lot of uh, work being done now, again, now that the vaccine is becoming more and more available, a lot of work is being done projecting when will different countries be able to access the vaccine. And I think that this map is so striking. You know, if I just took away the title and the legend for this map, 
you could probably put a lot of different titles on there. You could say like, where is the burden of disease in the world? <laughs> you could say, you know, where is the money in the world? And you would always find over and over again that the green countries are doing well and the red countries are not doing so well. So this, is, this has to do with vaccine distribution. Um, you can see that in the most rich countries, especially in North America and Europe, um, by late 2021, we'll probably, be, most of us will get our vaccine. But if you look in some of the countries in red, so some of the places in Sub-Saharan Africa and in Southeast Asia, those red countries, it's not projected until 2023. And I can't think of a single good reason why we should be getting vaccines any earlier than any other place in the world. So there's some work being done right now by People's Health Movement and other organizations, Doctors Without Borders is another group that's doing a lot of important work in this area um, to try to um, influence what's called the TRIPS waiver. So there is, um, and at the TRIPS waiver, the World Trade Organization has this, this agreement, it's kind of like a trade agreement called the TRIPS agreement. So um, under this, and it's a lot of different countries that agree to the same kinds of trade rules. Um, you can get really in the weeds with this if you'd like to. I'm going to try to keep it as simple as possible so I don't take up the entire time talking about the TRIPS agreement. Um, but there's a proposal underway right now that um, countries under the TRIPS agreement can waive patents which currently hinder vaccine production. So now we have a lot of the recipes that we need for the vaccine. Can we open it up so that the production side can really get going so we can produce enough vaccine for all the, for everyone who needs it in the world? So there are over 100 countries right now that support the TRIPS waiver, and there are some that don't. Um, the UK does not support the TRIPS waiver, and the United States doesn't support the TRIPS waiver, and there's some other countries listed as well, Australia, Norway, Japan, the EU are blocking um, the TRIPS waiver. And there's this giant cry from the global south to say, implement the TRIPS waiver. <laughs> you know, unlock the doors so that we can start producing this vaccine at levels that we need. Um, I really love this visual. This is something that is part of this campaign, um, the call from the global south to not block the TRIPS waiver proposal. So if you are interested in getting involved in any of this work with trade or with a specific TRIPS waiver, Again, a lot of these petitions were just distributed today, um, and there's going to be some links in this presentation that we can share afterwards, or if you ever want to get in touch with me, I'm happy to put you in touch with local activists that are working on this, um, this issue. Um, so this is something that PHM has also gotten involved with. I love putting in plugs for PHM because I think they're such a wonderful organization. Um, this is a, a petition that you can sign on to today. Um, or that you can um, have your organization sign on to as well. So that's the bulk of my content. I'm usually a very um, interactive speaker. So I, the same presentation usually takes me more than an hour to get through. <laughs> so I would love if you all have any questions or um, thoughts to share about anything that I, that I talked about today. Um, I have my contact information on there, and I also have our P the PHM website listed here. Um, but I would just love to spend the rest of the time kind of hearing from you all, hearing your questions and your thoughts, um, or your rebuttals. <laughs> Those are sometimes really fun. Well, thank you so much to, um, for that really um, interesting and important talk. I thought that was such a good overview of so many very complicated issues that I'm sure we could spend forever talking about. But yeah, thank you very much. Um, and thank you for all the resources as well. Um, just to note, we'll, Julia has very kindly said that she'll send these slides through to us. So we'll make sure to post them in the Facebook event after this talk so that you can all kind of follow the links and do a bit more research yourselves to yeah find out more about everything Julia just went through. Um, so great, so we've got, um, as Julia said, a bit of time for a QA and a now. Um, I've had some questions through privately to me already um, that I can kick off with, but please do post any other questions you've got in the chat um, and I can read them out to Julia or if it's more comfortable just send them to me directly and I can also ask them then. Um, so I'm going to actually start off with one of my questions. <laughs> um, so not to get um, too kind of bogged down in, in patent, but um, 
So one of the things um, you were saying about patient, I thought was really interesting. So I, I've kind of previously read a book that was quite skeptical of, of um, kind of large scale donations to organizations to like the WHO and things like that from, from people like the Gates Foundation who also kind of have business interests with Microsoft and companies like that, which are obviously kind of fighting their own patent battles. And, and I guess just concerned about the potential conflict of interests. And yeah, it's not something that I necessarily have an opinion on at this point, because I don't, I don't think I know enough about it, but I'd love to hear what you think. Well, I mean, I, I'm sure it's not going to come to a surprise as a surprise to you at this point that, you know, a lot of, a lot of the mess that we're in right now has to do with capitalism. You know, honestly, most of the inequities that we see in the world are because of the in, in, inequitable distribution of wealth. And that is usually tied back to our capitalist society that we live in. So yes, I mean, the big donations from places like the Gates Foundation, um, you know, can be really problematic. Gates has its own business interests in, in Microsoft. Um, I think also that there's a level of, um, personal interests that maybe the decision makers within the foundation or within a lot of these big philanthropic foundations, they have their own kind of personal interests or pet projects that they might really focus on. And it might not align with what the community needs. A lot of times it doesn't. You know, I mentioned that I've worked in HIV for 15 years or more. And I can tell you without a doubt that within the communities where I worked, HIV was not a primary concern. You know, like a lot of places in West Africa where I work, they're like, hey, I get malaria two or three times a year. Can you do a malaria program? That's what I need. But that's not what the funding organizations are really focused on. And I think it's because a lot of the, the issues that, um, that face low and middle income countries in terms of global health have to do with um, systemic problems, right? So like malaria, getting malaria two or three times a year is because there's this Systemic issues, right? There's um, either lack of access to quality healthcare. There might be, um, you know, there's a lack of like funding for public hygiene campaigns. Like we don't get malaria in places like the United States, and we used to get malaria in the United States. And the reason we don't is because we had the public resources to be able to put into public hygiene programs to get rid of the mosquito, the malaria carrying mosquitoes, you know, on a wide systemic level. So. I guess this is a long way of saying that, yeah, I am skeptical of most funding organizations. I don't think that they are making, they aren't bridging that divide a lot of times between advocacy and implementation on the ground. If people in communities' voices were truly centered, I think that a lot of the funding decisions that we have writ large in the world and global health mm -hmm. would be much, much different than they are right now. And part of it's just because it's hard to, you know, it's easy to count how many, how many, you know, either vaccines you can deliver. It's easy to count how many people living with HIV are enrolled in your program. And it's a lot harder to count things like, you know, how, how many children are adequately, are receiving adequate nutrition or how, how affordable is healthcare in different places. Like that's not something that is an interest, as interesting for policymakers a lot of times to count and report on. So, yeah. And it is all tied up too in these like, it's, it's tied also with the pharmaceutical companies, right? Because if you are promoting an HIV program throughout the world, somebody's got to pay the pharma companies for all of those drugs, right? So it's like, it all kind of winds back together. And that's why my shorthand for it is it's capitalism's fault. But it's obviously a much more complicated answer than that. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely very interconnected when you kind of even look at it from a distance, like it, it's impossible yeah. to tease those things apart um, in some ways. Well, I, you know, and I, I, one way that I find is kind of a, is my shorthand for how I understand the world. And it's something that, that I really learned from my work with the People's Health Movement. It's looking at things through the political economy of health lens. And political economy of health is kind of a clunky term, but basically it means like zoom out and figure out who is making the decisions. Like where does the power and where does the money lie? And that's where you're usually gonna figure out like why is the world the way that it is? And it's because where the power and where the money is has dictated how things have played out. Um, again, like we weren't, this inequitable system that we have right now didn't fall down from the sky, we made it. 
and we can unmake it and we can make it anew. So I think um, kind of one of the questions that I was got through on the chat sort of ties into that quite quite neatly because I think that the natural point from that conclusion would be so what do we do about it? And um, <laughs> it's quite a, I guess it's it's a much smaller scale than um, a lot of the things that we've been talking about but one of the questions I had was we have um, as part of Students for Global Health I think I mentioned at the beginning we've got a kind of access to medicines subcommittee as part of our organization and they kind of do a lot of work around trying to improve access to medicines so one of the things that they've been doing recently is um, they sent an open letter to the University of Cambridge um, asking them to make COVID-19 health technologies affordable and accessible um, to everyone around the world um, and they, they've had some good responses from that but I guess um, some the person who asked the question wanted to know if there's kind of anything else that that we could be doing along those lines or or any other ways that we could think about that and how to really have an impact um, even at a student level. I mean I think another kind of rule of thumb that I have for advocacy is to find like-minded organizations because we are obviously much stronger together than we are separately and when we are able to combine our forces and our voices together it's going to be much more impactful. So I think it's fantastic the work that your organization is doing in terms of um, making sure that some of these technologies, especially academic, you, you know, academic institutions are often involved in the research and development of some of these technologies or vaccines or medicines or whatever. Um, I think that there is a movement actually amongst um, academic institutions that is similar to what it sounds like your group is doing as well. And coming together, I think, with those other organizations. I, I can't remember off the top of my head what the name of it is, but I'm happy to link you up afterwards if, you, if you'd like um, to join in with some of those other groups. Um, yeah, I think that's fantastic. Um, I think any, any kind of links that um, we, can, we can post and kind of make people aware of other groups and perhaps link up with them and, yeah, just make sure that we're on the, this Absolutely. work on things, um, that would definitely be a good thing for us to educate ourselves with and also a good thing to um, hopefully support. Um, I just saw that a question came through from Lee on the chat. Um, so he said that fascinating that talk. Thanks, Julia. Um, I wasn't fully aware of the Hep B vaccinator link to tracking down Osama bin Laden and the public health consequences that followed. Um, how best can this lesson be brought home to leaders around the world who can't always predict all the ramifications of things that they might condone? I mean, I think that this is is something that as public health professionals and advocates we need to be relentless about. I think that we need to be relentless about separating public health from global health security or from global security because I feel like the militaries and armies and all these things often try to blur these lines like who is the first person to go in or who's the first group to go in after a natural disaster. A lot of times it's like the army reserves or it's some kind of military adjacent organization because they have and the, the reason given is because they have the logistical systems and they have the access to different places that might need immediate support but every time that we blur the line between health and the military is dangerous for us because that the communities often mostly do not trust other countries' militaries, and for good reason. <laughs> History is their reason, <laughs> you know? And so I think we always, always, always have to be very careful about that. And I know in the US, I've been involved with a lot of different organizations that are um, working to separate some of these like health bases, like global health security is a very big term these days. That's kind of why I bungled it before. Um, and we really need to make sure that the lines are as clear as possible. Um, I don't know if policymakers they're, they're often not educated. That's the interesting thing, I think, working in advocacy and policy making writ large, often our same elected leaders have to be experts in a lot of different areas. And so we might be like in our own bubble of, um, you know, I know all about trade and health and I would expect my elected leader to know all about trade and health, but they might not. So we, it is also our responsibility to educate our leaders as much as possible because they might not necessarily either understand understand these ramifications or they might not understand the community um, impact of the decisions that they make. So it's up to us to amplify our voices. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. 
I just saw uh, Liz posted a follow up, so um, I'll just ask you that one as well, if that's okay. He said, thank you. In South Africa, I think COVID has brought together scientists, public health pr practitioners and policymakers in a whole new way. Um, which, yeah, I, I guess is um, an interesting observation. Yeah, I mean, and I think that's, that's the, that's the different thing I think about COVID that A, it's been such a universal epidemic and B, it has been such a fundamentally altering epidemic. The ways in which we've all had to change our lives has been unavoidable. You know, I think a lot of places, a lot of people in rich countries could completely ignore, you know, Ebola or they could completely ignore a natural disaster that might be happening in another part of the world, but they can't ignore you know, needing to wear a face mask out in public or the schools being closed or you can't work in an office anymore or go to school in a, in a, in a university anymore. Like we've all felt the impact of COVID in a way that I, I can't remember any other time of my life where we've been having to alter our lives to this extent. So it is kind of this interesting window for us to be able to, if you want to be really optimistic about it, we can build a whole new world after this, you know, we can change a lot of different things, either the way that we work together, the way that we communicate, the way that we can, you know, go in our cars less, you know, there's all kinds of ways in which we could choose to build our world up differently and better after this. Um, and I think that this cooperation period that we're seeing now is something that I think we have to be really careful about maintaining the positive aspects of that afterwards. It's not gonna happen on its own and it will be all too easy to revert, I think, after this. So understanding and intentionally, I think, moving forward in a way that's gonna take the best lessons of this moment that we're in right now, um, I think is up to us as well. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely true. And actually, I've just had a question through that kind of perfectly aligns with um, what you just said. So someone was asking, do you think that COVID-19 will prompt people to advocate more for just global health policies? Um, do you think that there will be any systemic change as a result of this? Because as you say, this is probably, I mean, it's, I mean I'm quite young, but it's definitely the first time that I've ever um, seen something that kind of has such a global health impact as, as COVID-19. I mean, I hope so, but I also know that it won't happen on its own. I think it's going to take all of us to be really, it's going to take a lot of effort for us to kind of make sure that these changes that we want to see in the world, um, some of these things that we are going to be rebuilding after COVID, we're going to have to work hard to make sure that that's just and equitable. We've already seen, you know, with that map that I put out up about, like we had this amazing global effort and we have these amazing vaccines that are going to be available that are available already, but we can already see how we're following some of our same inequitable um, distribution plans that are very familiar in terms of who gets to be first in the line and who's not. So that's why we have to take each moment as it comes, I think, and say, how can we do this the just way and the equitable way? And we have to raise our voices and point out where, you know, we're perpetuating some of the systems that we don't have to perpetuate. Um, I just I find that that's kind of the most empowering way of looking at this, and I think that that's um, the most um, it's the it's the way in which we can perhaps build back the best world that we can. And again, as advocates, you don't see moments of social um, upheaval like this often, which is I guess good for the world writ large. But it, for us moving forward in terms of trying to bring people together in terms of trying to change policy for the better, um, this is a window in which we can do that. And I hope that we do. I think that for me, one of the things that really struck me about COVID as well was even aside from the kind of discrepancies and how accessible the vaccine is to different countries, um, there's also such discrepancies in how kind of set up countries are to accurately monitor like the outbreak of COVID. I mean, I mean, it's difficult if you can't even track where it goes. And it's, you see countries like New Zealand where they've got a, an excellent, um, you know, kind of policy in place and, and it's much easier for them to control it because they just can see how it's spreading. Um, whereas in other parts of the world, that's just not possible. Yeah. I mean, it definitely goes back to the question of health systems, right? And who, where are the health systems the most functional? And I think that those are the ones that are, are reacting better to COVID than other places. You know, like the US's health system isn't necessarily fantastic either. And we saw this massive like explosion of COVID. I mean, it had other, I think there are lots of different reasons why COVID went so 
bananas in the US. But, um, you know, again, with other epidemics that we've seen, I always go back to Ebola as well, because Ebola, I think when Ebola came out, there were something like 50 doctors in Sierra Leone or something like that for the whole country. And it's like that had existed for decades before Ebola came about, but it was when that very deadly epidemic happened that people started looking around being like, well, why aren't there any doctors? And you could trace the story back to kind of these multilateral, uh, you know, reasons where it's like, well, you could look at the IMF policies that restricted the, the amount of money that Sierra Leone could allocate toward doctor salaries because nobody wanted to become a doctor in Sierra Leone because it only made $200 a month or something like that. And it's like, you can trace it back to these macroeconomic structures that very accurately predict the future, right? So then you have a shock to the system like an epidemic and it shines a light on the ways in which we have been um, unfairly distributing wealth in the world. And I think, I think that, that ties in quite nicely um, with another question that I got through a little while ago um, that I'm just getting around to asking now, sorry to um, the person who asked it, but um, someone asked, what are the kind of steps that we can take to advocate for decolonizing the aid systems? Um, because obviously, as you mentioned earlier in your talk, um, your personal experience was that, um, you know, when you were, um, kind of working in the dust you'd, you'd see that NGOs come in and it, it was quite yeah quite separate so what would be your thoughts around that topic? Well I mean I think again I think that the aid system it, it this is another macroeconomic system right it's something that is multilateral multinational um, there are different kinds of donor organizations whether they are philanthropies whether they are governments whether they are multilateral institutions like the WHO and, and each one of those places decides how they're going to spend their money. So I think it's up to us as if you do work in an NGO or if you are involved in the aid industry, then you need to lift your voices to talk about how your industry is doing wrong. And that is something that isn't always popular, you know, especially because the, I think the public perception of aid work in general is look at all the good they're doing for, um, for different communities around the world. And it's like, well, Yes, and, you know, like, yes, there are lots of groups that are really trying to do good work in different parts of the world. But if you look back again at these systems that prop up the aid industry and, this, and, and the decisions that go behind what we fund and what we don't fund, who gets to sit around the table when these decisions are made. So I think that part of what we need to do within the industry and maybe from external pressure as well is to start at that table and say, who is there and whose voice is being heard? And when you see that, the people who are not impacted by the program at all are not, you know, or the people who are impacted by the program are not at the table. You're gonna see how these systems are not responsive to the needs of the community. So whether we're talking about trade, whether we're talking about aid, we always need to advocate for, we need civil society at the table. We need them to be there and, talk, and have their voices centered. Um, I think we're making baby steps in that direction, but I don't think that we're there by any means yet. And so that's part of what we need to do, whether we are the civil society organizations and we need to demand a place at the table. If we are on the other side, if we are in the, pow the power position, then we need to look around and see who is being heard at this, at this meeting, who is being heard in this program development um, and making sure that it's not gonna be somebody like me who's making a decision about a community program in West Africa, for instance. Yeah. yeah. Obviously the people who are kind of, also the ones who, who are much more parts of those communities will, to a certain extent, be, be the best people to understand how those programs will impact them. So it's, it's not just a case of including them for inclusion's sake, but it just it makes sense um, on a whole. And, and likewise, I can say too, you know, one of the things about my work with the People's Health Movement is, you know, I work with PHM US. And so we're very focused on trying to make our struggles local struggles to see about our own communities and where we are close to home. You know, we are part of this global network because we see that struggles can be, um, can be similar in different parts of the world and we can learn from each other and we can amplify each other's voices. But the actual work that we're going to be doing within these different country chapters is going to be hyper local because that's the most appropriate place for us to be able to be working 
on community problems. Um, I shouldn't be trying to solve the problems that are faced by some of my colleagues in India or in South Korea or in name your country across the world. I can support them and I can amplify them and I can um, celebrate their victories, but I'm not gonna dictate their solutions to their problems. That's a really interesting perspective. Um, there's a couple more questions coming through on chat. I'm aware that we're kind of getting to the end of the talk, so I will try and keep it quite brief. Um, just to circle back um, to what you were talking about a little bit earlier, Thea asked, um, well, she said, thanks for a fascinating talk. Um, I'm just wondering if you could expand a little bit more on the idea of global grassroots organization. So how does that function or collaborate effectively across such varied countries? Um, which I guess ties in quite nicely with what you were just saying as well, um, really. Mm -hmm. So the way the PHM is organized is that it is a global network. Um, each country has a con or each country that participates with PHM has a country circle, and then country circles are also organized re with regional circles. So P I'm part of PHM North America as well, which is um, for weird reasons. North America is only Canada and the U.S. because because of language reasons. Mexico organized with Latin America. Anyway, um, <laughs> so we um, there's you know there's structures. There's a steering committee. There's an advisory council. There's regular meetings and collaborations across the world that happen. So it is you know it is a grassroots network, but there are also some organizational principles and some really dedicated activists that keep it going. I don't think there's I think there might be one human that is paid. And PHM, and then the rest of it is all um, organ, all volunteer. That's amazing. Um, yeah, that's really, that's really. Cool. I mean, it's not that amazing. I wish that we could pay a lot more people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, because there's a lot of people it's who spend a lot people, of this, yeah. Um, yeah, are willing to do so much for communities. Um, and then I think this might have to be our last question, unfortunately. Um, I do have a couple of other ones that I've been sent, but I think, yeah, uh, it's just coming to the close. Um, so Alice asked, thanks for a fascinating talk, Julia. You mentioned supporting NGOs who have real visions for a more ideal world. Where do Big Pharma fit into some of these visions? Currently, they have a huge role in R&D, allocating huge amounts of money and absorbing certain risks. If the system can be changed, who takes on the financial risk of r and I mean, r and is kind of, R&D is a frustrating argument for me because, like I mentioned, a lot of times pharmaceutical companies are actually funded by research grants from governments, which are public resources. Um, and, you know, and a lot of times, too, they're able to recoup their costs quite quickly. So R&D is always tricky for me. I, I discount it pretty quickly, I guess. Um, in terms of risk, you know, there's a global community of science that and research and development dollars that do not necessarily come from private corporations. Um, so, yeah, I, I think in terms of collaboration and cooperation, you know, in some ways we are also really affiliated with pharmaceutical companies, at least in our, in our um, current day scenario, they are the ones who are producing these critical drugs and vaccines right? And we need them <laughs> in a lot of ways to be able to combat some of these epidemics or some health conditions and that kind of thing. So I think what we just need is the public, for pharmaceutical companies to be more publicly accountable. Um, a lot of that has to do with transparency so that we're actually able to measure um, how much R&D is shared by the public, which I think is quite a lot. Um, and yeah, and just being, I think, having to be more accountable to communities, having us be able to be uh, more able to hold them to account because we do have more access to their data. Um, I think that sharing data is incredibly critical. I, I currently work for an, I think I mentioned at the beginning, I work for an academic journal who's very um, committed to open access and data availability. And I think that those kinds of principles are what's needed for a just world and what's needed for an equitable health world as well. So that's not a very tangible answer. That's kind of more of a another one of my diatribes, but um, there are actionable steps as well um, that we could get to that point. Yeah, I think yeah, that's, um, definitely yeah, an important kind of perspective to take. Um, so I'm aware that it's eight, and well, one minute past eight, and we've we've kept you for more than <laughs> we, longer than we were meant to. Um, so. 
Thank you very much for taking the time to give us such an interesting talk um, and and especially, you know, just sharing the resources that you've linked to. Um, I think a lot of people in the society will be really interested in following those up. Um, as I said, we'll post them in the Facebook group afterwards along with the slides. But yeah, thank you again. Um, thank you guys. And it was it was a pleasure to have you. <laughs> <laughs> Great. All right. Take care. <laughs> Bye. Bye.